In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, Intercede for me. We had been meditating on what is known as the first multiplication of the loaves and fishes. That episode very near Capernaum, most probably just in the next cove after what is properly Capernaum, when our Lord had performed that wonderful miracle after having attended to the needs of the crowd, the needs of their intellect, teaching them, the needs of their bodies, healing their sick, and then taking care of their food as well. Well, at the end of that episode, St. Matthew continues. Then he made the disciples get into the boat, the boat that they had used going to that cove, and go before him to the other side, go back to Capernaum while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Doesn't it fill you with such a longing for those moments? When our Lord with the sacred humanity shows himself to be fully human, not just fully divine, performing that miracle. Because of course he had to dismiss the crowd. Remember there were 5,000 men not counting women and children. So it was quite the crowd. And he could have just disappear with the apostles, go back to Capernaum. Why go back to Capernaum? Because that's where they lived. They were really going back. But before going with them, they had to dismiss the crowd. Go in peace, the mass is ended. Many times the priest would say at the end of the mass, and we really miss the times when parishes were a lot smaller, especially in the provinces, when the priest, instead of just saying that, go in peace, the mass is ended, would really go out and mingle with the crowd, like what we see in some films that the Protestant pastors do just because their congregations are small. A typical complaint is that the Catholic Church is becoming personal. And to a large extent, that's true because we, we don't have enough priests. If there were enough, then the ratio of parishes of faithful to priests would be healthier and not the present 10,000 or 12,000 souls for every priest. So if there are 12,000 people who will go to Mass on Sunday, to be quote unquote service ministered to by one priest, then you can imagine he cannot really mingle with the crowds. But I really did. Let's do some numbers. It's always good to crunch numbers, to be in numerically uh, agile. The gospel said there were 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So if you add women and children, there would have been what? 7,000, 8,000. So there were about 8,000 people in that crowd. Didn't we say that the ratio, the present ratio of faithful to priests in the Philippines is about 10 to 12,000? Typical parish, that would be the ratio. Where our Lord was able to dismiss the crowd affectionately, the 8,000 strong crowd. So I would say that 8,000 to 10,000 people is par for the course, if you put it to the standards of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a matter of concern. It's a matter of being a pastor. It's a matter of rapport between a priest and his parishioners. If there's real rapport, then what happened would happen. Our Lord stayed behind to dismiss the crowd. Not just dismiss them, but to say goodbye the way <clears throat> especially we Filipinos say goodbye at the end of a gathering. Typical party, you say goodbye. 
people don't live all together. They live in trickles, but still, when finally everybody leaves, what happens? They say goodbye in the dining room or in the sala or in the garden, wherever it is that they were having their sobre mesa, their get together after, after eating. They'll say goodbye on the path to the gate. They say goodbye at the gate. They say goodbye on the road outside the gate all the way to the car. Because that's the way friendship is. It wants to be prolonged. And that's what I do think. But then what's even more amazing is what happens afterwards. After he had dismissed the crowd, so in principle, what should have happened next was he should have even walked with some of them back to Capernaum. He had sent his apostles ahead, the disciples ahead. Remember, they were on a boat rowing back to Capernaum, but he, he could have gone with, with the crowds back to Capernaum for those people who lived in Capernaum. Others were living in other villages along the way. But no, because he went up the hills to be alone in order to pray. Again, this whole scene uh, lends itself to the meditation of a typical parish priest because that's what happens on a typical Sunday or what should happen. First, the banquet, the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, the Eucharistic celebration of the mass, masses, because with the ratio that we have, if you have 10,000 faithful having to go to mass on a Sunday, you can imagine they're not going to be all together in one mass. They will be, be, they will be in many masses. That's why the typical priest in this country on a Sunday, especially in the provinces, would celebrate five to six masses. By the way, that's illegal, so to speak. Canon law prohibits that. But what can you do? So everybody turns a blind eye just to be able to give masses to enable all the faithful to go to Mass on Sunday. Not just in the parish priest, but the so-called visitation chapels that, that every parish priest knows he, he has to take care of. All in a day's work. At the end of which, hopefully, he should find time to pray, to go up the mountain, the ascent, to that union, to that communion, to that intimacy with the reason of his life, who is our Lord, who is even physically present in the tabernacle of the church and adjacent to which he is staying. Our Lord shows us the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. In this life, we will see many miracles. If we're faithful, we will pass through many trials too many moments of doubt, but at the end of it, we should always go back to the same thing. That moment of prayer, that afternoon prayer, that prayer of integration that we were referring to earlier, where we put together everything, where everything comes together, in the absence of which we run the risk of going from one day to another, just Victims of circumstances, battered by all the events of each day. Well, talking about battered, a bunch of people were really getting battered at that time. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was many furlongs distance from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Again, the literal sense. Some time ago, we had been considering how it's possible that on a placid lake like Taal, for example, that normally looks so placid, that in the afternoon, with the change of winds, that many storms could arise. I told you the story of how many years ago, going to the Al Volcano with my geology class with, with uh, Professor Punung Bayan, the famous Punung Bayan, Ray. And on our way back after lunch, precisely something like that happened. And that was this 
must be the scariest moment in my life because the waves were big and was were swamping the boats, the bankas that we were using. Well, something like that was happened to these men who were being swamped by the waves because the wind was contrary to them and they were not making much progress or only with difficulty on their way back to Kafarnaum. And yet our Lord was there praying. A lot of times it happens in this life that we feel that, you know, that it's as if we're having such a tough time, like what's happened, like happening right now with many people, I suppose, some of you even, or many of you with this pandemic. And then you've been praying and it seems like our Lord is somewhere else. And we get tempted to, to panic and to take things into to our own hands, so to speak, and start making shortcuts, doing something which is less than morally upright because we need to survive. I suppose that's what's behind all those shenanigans happening, people making money at the expense of other people. It's not that people are really opportunists all the time. Some are not opportunists. It's that, as we say in Tagalog, hawak sa patalim. But that can happen. And that's the recipe for despair. We should never forget that our Lord is looking at us. And there's a reason why the fourth watch, of course, it was already the fourth watch. There was almost daybreak already. They had been rowing <coughs> and laboring the whole night while Jesus had been praying, most probably even praying for them. But on the fourth watch, our Lord went to them. Oh, my Lord, you're always watching. You're never really far away. You always had an ace up your sleeve. It's we who are not praying. It's we who are not consulting. It's we who are trying to do things our own way and fumbling all over the place. Because you, my Lord, know everything. And you are all powerful and you are all loving. You, you have it all figured out. We just need to coordinate. We just need to consult. We need to pray. We need to have that face time with you on a daily basis. We have to get our marching orders every day in the morning with the morning mental prayer. And we have to resolve what has happened during the day in the afternoon mental prayer. A life lived like that would be a life that is serene. I'm not going to say easy because this life will never be easy. But yes, serene. Because we know what we're supposed to do. Because the, the greatest source of anxiety is uncertainty. And for a son of God, a daughter of God, to be uncertain? It's just really tragic. We're the children of the light. If we're uncertain, if anyone is uncertain, it's its own doing. Our Lord has placed us <clears throat> in the best possible situation. And for those of you who are listening to this meditation, it means to say, therefore, you're even in touch with Opus Dei. You're in touch with the means of formation. You know what the norms are. You know what the means of formation are. You have access to spiritual direction. You have access to the monthly recollections and the closed retreats. And for crying out loud, you have these meditations almost on a daily basis. So if a person like that is still uncertain, it's because he's not really making these things work. Oh my Lord, you hold the key. Vedans Eos. Seeing them, he approached them, walking on the water. And they thought it was a ghost. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. Oh, my Lord, how patient you are with us. 
because at times, unfortunately, many times, people are confronted with the situation in front of them, the signs of the times, they would say, and they misread them for lack of prayer, for lack of uh, real contemplation, and many times even for lack of availability to the plans of God, of docility. In other words, it's not that they don't see, they refuse to see. They'd rather look the other way. Drave the rather insist in their own position. I've known people who are like that, even very bright people, people with very high IQs, who somehow refuse to accept the facts that are in front of them. And they suffer through life because of that refusal to accept reality. Definitely, with our intellect, we're supposed to know what God wants, the right order of things, and we're not supposed to accept nature, quote-unquote, as is. Nature is there for us to dominate it. That's what God said to Adam and Eve, right? Dominate the earth. But to dominate the earth doesn't mean to violate the rules of nature that God has placed there. Rather, it has to, to induce from nature all its intrinsic possibilities after having understood the natural law, even the physical laws of nature. That's what's supposed to happen. However, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the person who, knowing that things are like that, even perhaps even getting a bit of inspiration in the little prayer that he's doing, and nevertheless refuses to quote unquote toe the line refuses to do things according to the mind of God. Then it's like hitting his head on a wall because the will of God will always be done. The will of God is immovable. Either we adjust to it and conform our lives or we're going to suffer and suffer needlessly. And the bad thing about that is since nobody is an isolated verse, then most probably will make other people suffer as well. That's the source of evil in the world. That's the source of pain in the world. It's the antithesis of the kingdom of God. Well, our Lord went there and they were afraid. It's a ghost, they say. They were terrified. As people are terrified by the events happening in their lives. Are terrified even, can you imagine this? Terrified by what God is doing with their lives. It's so like if a person were terrified of the surgeon, terrified of the doctor, well, I can understand children terrified of the doctor. When I was a kid, just uh, the sight of the doctor terrified me because I know I knew what was happening next. It's an injection. Hmm? But a grown up should not be afraid of doctors, should not be afraid of procedures. Should I be afraid even of an operation? Because you know, it's, it's just an operation. It's going towards a better situation. The apostles were afraid. They were afraid of Jesus. They think he's a ghost. And that's what's going to happen. That's what happens when people do not pray enough. They do not recognize the signs of the times. They mistake the loving hand of God with a ghost, a terrible, fearsome ghost. But immediately he spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, have no fear. Take heart, it is I, have no fear. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, bid me come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Another one of those moments of bravado of Peter, where his heart goes ahead of, of his mind, of his intellect, the language of the heart. We should allow ourselves to be moved by that language. Allow the heart to get the better of us. 
Have you ever confronted our Lord in the tabernacle? Perhaps in a, in a moment of decision making, <clears throat> of coming to, to terms with the reality in front of you, coming to terms with what our Lord is making you understand is his will. But then it's really tough. You don't want to let go of your plans. But finally, love prevails. It's the language of the heart. But have you ever been in a, in a situation where you confront your Lord in a tabernacle or in the intimacy of your prayer, and you actually tell him, Lord, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't do this. In Tagalog, it comes out so nice. Kung hindi lang kita mahal, hindi ko gagawin to. But I love you. Because you love me. So what can I do? So I trust in you. And so even if it doesn't seem right that I should be walking on waters, on the water, since you say come, then I jump and I go. And wonder of wonders, he starts walking on the water. Isn't that what happens when we follow through with an inspiration in our prayer? We follow through with an advice we receive in spiritual direction. We follow through with the resolutions of the closed retreat, despite the fact that we had tried them before and they didn't work. But now our Lord is telling us again, cast out the nets, pay out the nets. But we had worked the whole night and caught nothing. But at your word, we will pay it out. Our Lord knows what he's doing. And so Peter walks on water until, <laughs> until he doesn't. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink. Now comes the discount. Because after that initial moment, or perhaps even moments, or even days of correspondence to the will of God, then the difficulties come. And then the voice of the old man, the prudence of the flesh, perhaps even peer pressure, or what the mass media is saying, or what the others are saying. Be practical. And he starts to sink. For as long as he had his eyes fixed on our Lord, listening only to our Lord, to the Holy Spirit in our soul, he was, he was doing fine. But when he's, he started looking at other things, the waves, noticing the wind, perhaps even allowing human reason, human prudence to set in, this is not logical. And then he starts to sink. That is the spiritual sense of this marvelous scene. The drama of divine intervention, it was divine inspiration, the drama of our response and thereby doing supernatural things, and the debacle of falling into human reason, but forgetting. But thank God, Jesus is always there. He had enough sense, Peter, to say, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him saying, oh, man of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. This drama is played out almost on a daily basis for the prayerful soul. Perhaps not as remarkable, not as dramatic, but definitely so many conversions, so many inspirations, so many occasions of walking on water. Why do you think prayerful people are so cheerful? Why do you think prayerful people are so almost nonchalant about life? Because this drama has become for them a daily fare. It's normal, so to speak. And what many people think as unusual, miraculous, is a normal fare for a pr prayerful person, for a person with supernatural outlook. Because what is supernatural is no less real 
The only thing is it's supernatural. But if you're akin to that, then that's your day. That's your typical day. Many things depend on forget it on whether you and I live our lives as God wants. Let's live our lives as God wants on a daily basis and be witnesses of these miracles, of these great adventures, again, on a daily basis. I think you have about five minutes left to finish the prayer. Mm -hmm.